Hey there, retail investors. Welcome back to another episode for me. The chip industry is really on fire because there are a lot of shortages in the supply right now. There are even some companies which had to stop production due to the lack of supply. Just think about some of the car manufacturers. You would say that this would be a big boon for the whole chip industry. And it is actually, because if you look at AMD, Nvidia and for instance Broadcom, they really have been on fire over the last 12 months. But there seems to be just one laggard and that's really Intel. Why is that? What's going on there? I actually think that most of you would know some of it already because it has been in the news all over the place. But what I would like to discuss today is really why did the share price drop so much after the latest earnings this week? Was it really that bad? Answering this question is important to me to understand the way I would like to invest in it. So I'll do this by having a look into their Q3 earnings today and I briefly share what's going on in generally and then I'll share my personal investment case with you for Intel. As you hear, we have a lot to get through, including some observations that I actually heard nobody talking about. But hey, if you're new to this channel, just know that it's my goal to make dividend investing easier for all of us in the community. So stay tuned, have your coffee or tea, and let's get started. So let's just get started because it's clear that Intel has been underperforming its competitors. Just look at the difference between Texas Instruments and TSMC. Um, Intel has a year to date or let's say a one year return of around minus 17% while Texas Instruments a boring you know chip producer is up 50% and the MSC is up 97%. I mean, the chip industry is booming at the moment. There's a big shortage. Of course, it might impact a little bit when you think about the supply chain, but there's so much demand and Intel is really not able to benefit from it. A reason for that, in my opinion, is that they have underinvested over the last years in innovation, and that's what they are paying the price for now. Bob Swan, the former CEO, is out. They replaced him with Pat Gelsinger, a an, an former engineer, and I think it is a brilliant move, but it will need time, this company. But the result in the meanwhile is that the company is really not valued highly if you look at the price per earnings multiples. For instance, Intel is the most undervalued stock at the moment based on the PE multiple compared definitely towards AMD and Nvidia as an example, just with a PE of 11 and a free price to free cash flow or a price to cash flow of six compared to the others. So this sounds like this company is really, really cheap. Well, we have to look into this because if we also look at the earnings uh, results from um, last Thursday, what you can see is that the price dropped 12% almost the day after. So the question here really is, were the earnings that bad? Was it that bad to, to give a 12% and a massive sale from current investors to get rid of this stock? Well, I doubt, but you know, what is important here is what are the expectations? So let's have a look at what Pat Gelsinger said in March when they did the Intel Unleashed. He predicted that they would have a revenue of 72 billion, a gross margin of 56.5% and an EPS for the full year of 4.55. I mean, this is what the expectations were that he set and it's important to compare to this. Because if we look at the pundits, the pundits are saying here, like on CNBC for instance, you know, I sold because of uh, they are very inconsistent and they've been lowering their gu guidance. So the question remains, have they? At the same time, they look at the CapEx number, which is seems to be growing and it's not clear uh, what to do with the foundry business as such. Really, let's look into it soon. But the other uh, uh, pundit here says, oh, you know, the PCs collapsed, especially notebooks. Well, duh, no wonder. I mean, last year, everyone needed notebooks by working from home, kids being at home. You know, it was a huge replacement cycle. People had, people had just money left in the end of the month because they were not spending anything. So, from my opinion, um, I don't look at these pundits, but these headlines are typically driving the, the, the narrative of the day. And that's why you typically see large sell-offs or uptakes. And, you know, as smart investors, we really have to do our own homework. So, remember, guidance was 4.55 um, EPS. So, enough said about this. Let's look into the qu uh, quarterly report from last Thursday. So what you will see is if you open the 10K is that they're actually their revenue growth was not that bad. 10% in data center and 2% here on the CCG. Um, but at the same time, they mentioned partially offset by lower revenue in the cloud service providers market segment. This is, of course, not good because we have seen that Azure and, and Amazon, they're just, you know, 
killing it at the moment with earnings and we'll see that probably also next week at the same time they're also complaining about industry-wide component shortages i understand this there are supply chain issues to use it as an excuse as a chip producer is a bit awkward of course but hey there's the issue here because it's really a difficult supply chain and they use a lot of components to compile the final uh, design of a chip so this is what we're talking about here and if we then look at the earnings like hey 455 remember and they're saying like okay we earned in q3 171 167 uh, so 167 is the gap and 171 the non-gap compared to slightly more than a dollar last year so this looks really good right so you would expect really the the earnings to pop up here but you know let's have a look into this because you know these are the headline numbers and i have learned over the past also when looking at ibm and other companies specifically companies that are in trouble that you really have to go into the income statement the cash flow statement and balance sheet itself because they are often window dressing so let's have a look into that so what we can see in the income statement is that the revenue of the last three months grew compared to last year around this time. And you see this is almost like 800 million more, which is like around 5%. Also on a nine months basis, it's also been slightly growing. So, so far so good. And they seem to be on track to, to make their 72 billion or 74 billion or something like that. So I don't see an issue here. Uh, what well, is good to know that the gross margin over the last decade has been declining from around 65% to around 56% right now. But what is really interesting here is that their operating income is 5.2 billion compared to 5 billion last year. So they made again 4% more in operating income. And overall, they are down comp uh, for the first nine months. But this was a little bit as per expectation as well. And we've seen the, the uh, impact of their income in the first two quarters. What is really interesting here is that, and this is why the uh, earnings per share are so high, 1.68 because they had gains on the uh, equity investments so what are gains on equity investments typically you know what they do is with the short term uh, or with their cash position and such the the short term assets they invest in other companies and such and based on that they need to book also gains uh, here so this is what my expectation is but we need to look into this because what they are doing here is they are keeping that in the current earnings numbers and most often companies keep it out because they say you know these are not like for like comparisons that we can do so if we would take this out, probably the earnings would be more around 1.12, 1.13 per share. So let's have a quick look into this. Okay, so if we look at the notes here, gains of equity investment interests of other are highlighted here. They are the sale of equity investments and during the uh, and during the third quarter, quarter it included almost half a billion of initial fair value adjustments related to four, to four companies that went public. So effectively, the assets are more worth on their balance sheet and they had to um, um, facilitate for those in the income statement. But at the same time, they got a special dividend of 1.1 billion paid in connection with the sale of Mc McAfee's enterprise business. So, you know, this is it. A one off they did a, they invested like they would be berkshire hathaway and they got you know a really nice uh, income from this 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 quarter but you know they are not berkshire hathaway it's not their core business so in my opinion if they really want to use non-gap they should have left it out from therefore i count here let's say 1.12 so if we go back to the nine months er earnings so far, they are saying it's around 376 per share right now. So if we deduct 60 cents from this, I think ar they are around 315, let's say, something like that. So they still need to make 140 in the upcoming quarter. Well, they are probably not going to make that if they are having these kinds of operating income. So yes, I understand that going forward, it will be hard to make the 455 for the full year. I think it will be rather around 4.20. And we need to we need to uh, anticipate on that. Because if you then look at the current share price of 49 and it's 4.20, I don't have a calculator with me, but it's probably like 12 PE or something like that. And not the 11 PE that they are guiding for. So that's like a 10% difference. So I actually understand why the market is responding with a 10% downgrade of, of the stock and the share price because they have been not been able to live up to, the, to their EPS. So let's also have a quick look into their cash flows. If we look at here, the cash flow is generally a lot of working capital adjustments. Uh, again, last year they were able to beef up the cash flow during the pandemic, but now they need to pay the price for it because, you know, there's just so so much you can do with accounts payable inventories and uh, accounts receivable so that's why the cash flow is more impacted uh, this time and a little bit uh, uh, lower and you see that here with 24 billion but you know they still have a lot to invest in the upcoming quarter because they are aiming for another 7 billion i think in investments i thought they wanted to do 18 billion of cash uh, capex this amount uh, this year 
So knowing that they will probably have an operating cash flow around 31 billion or something like that, minus 18 billion. So we will have 13 billion in free cash flow, minus on average five and a half billion of dividends over a full year, because we need to remember these are nine months, will give us still a nice payout ratio of around, what is it, 50, 60%. So the dividend is safe, no issues about this, but we need to also look forward later and I will show you what I mean with that. By the way, what's good to know, I checked the average payment of dividends over the last uh, 10 years and specifically the last three four years it has been always around five and a half billion why were they able to grow the dividend with seven percent over those years is mainly because of share repurchase they have been re very aggressive in share repurchases and this is why uh, they hardly need to increase the dividend payment in absolute numbers because the share reduction is taking care of the share um, uh, of the dividend growth so this is it from my point of view of a 10k it didn't look too bad but you know definitely the earnings were impacted and they tried to window dress it with these one-off uh, uh, earnings and the market is not buying it so this is in my opinion the main reason why the company is down 10 percent after hours and in my opinion also rightly so but it doesn't tell us whether it's a bad investment right now because there's just a lot of market sentiment against Intel. People are tired of it and they wonder, can they really turn around this ship? So let's have a look into just the valuation as such and taking some of those thoughts into consideration. So if we look into some of the popular valuation metrics, we can see here that they have a dividend growth uh, streak of seven years, but actually I would say it's 20 years because they haven't cut it since 2000, but seven years ago they kept their dividend flat. At the, at the moment of speaking, they have a dividend yield of 2.8% and a five-year dividend growth track record of 7.7%. doesn't meet the chowder rule, so it's not heavily undervalued from a chowder point of view, but um, that, that's okay, we don't need this always. From EPS and FCF, uh, free cash flow payout, it seems really cheap 30% and 27% and a PE of 11 and a forward PE also makes it based on the earnings multiple very cheap compared to where the broader market is and specifically compared to their peers. Revenue growth of 5.5% is really not bad and we saw just that their revenue is still growing this year. I expect it also to grow next year based on their forward guidance and I have no reason to believe in this uh, current market why that wouldn't be the case. Um, EPS growth I don't expect it to go so quick anymore also from a five-year cash flow point of view growth free cash flow I expect that actually to decline and we'll show that soon they have a really solid balance sheet of, uh, of uh, AA and I also no issue here but because their debt to equity is 40% I prefer it to be on the 60% 60 so they still have a lot of room to grow also their in return on investment capital is much bigger than the uh, weighted average cost of capital so that means that the company is creating value for us at the same time I wanted to show you here the last six years they have reduced their share count by about 16% and this has been funding the dividend growth a lot over the last several years as I mentioned earlier from a dividend history point of view you can see it here nice growth because if you keep the dividend payout in absolute numbers over the years over the last few years flat but you keep continue buying back shares then this is a typical result that you will see now why do I have here and this is probably the first shock for you a dividend payout ratio on the free cash flow of 145 percent is just because the future free cash flow is looking bad with the capital investments that they are doing here so let's have a look into that they are saying that in the next year they are having a range of 25 billion to 28 billion in capex for 2022 so let's run with this I think they will have a forward div uh, operating cash flow 32 billion minus the capex gives us a free cash flow 4 billion probably they cannot buy back any shares unless they will go into debt for this so therefore the dividends are not covered because I think that the dividend uh, payout will grow from 5.5 billion to around 5.8 billion if they do an increase in dividends hence the dividends are not covered and that's why we have such a large um, dividend payout ratio so just already prepare yourself for next year that many people will complain in the dividend investment community that their dividends will not be covered by free cash flow consider that a one or two year off because they are investing now heavily in the foundry in the in the fat business which has cost them a lot of capex going forward you need to take this into consideration so where the share price is today if people start looking at it from a dividend payout point of view including the institutional investors then maybe just uh, expect a further decline in share price next year and this might be then actually a buying opportunity but let's go into that after we have discussed some of the catalysts and the risks so if we look at it I think that the catalysts are really still the chip, uh, the chip industry growth, the total addressable, addressable market is growing. I think 
that Intel will not outperform them, but still get their uh, piece of the cake there. But also, I think that the protectionism by governments like in Europe and the US, where they want to have local production of chips and not be depending on China is a big catalyst for Intel going forward, even if they lost their mojo with innovation. So I think they're actually in a really good spot because they have time to figure things out from an innovation point of view. But there are some risks also. What if they are not able to innovate? What if they really lost it? You know, then we will see a declining business like IBM, in my opinion. So watch out for that. At the same time, we see companies like Apple, Microsoft, and Google all willing to take their own own chip design in them in their own business and you know work directly with TMSC. You need to you need to be conscious of this. Of course, they are not uh, delivering to the full market. There's enough space beyond that, but it's really a trend that you need to look, need to keep taking an eye on. And last but not least, you know what happens with such companies like uh, Intel that they are not able to get the big talent from the universities anymore because they will probably go to Apple and Google. They have much more creativity there. They are there in growing businesses, not in declining business and we really need to take this into consideration. So all in all, it's not a well-running business at the moment. There are significant risk there. So for me, an, uh, a multiple of 10, 12 is definitely uh, justified under the current market conditions. Okay, so knowing all of this, and I haven't done a full business analysis as I mentioned, because then this video will take half an hour longer. Let's go into the valuation that I foresee for this company. So if we look at it from a discounted cash flow point of view, what I'm doing here is I'm assuming in the free cash flow actually a 0% growth over the next five years. And I will actually show what I mean with that. But after that, looking at today's cash flow, I think there will be 7% growth. I want a discount rate of 10% due to the risk associated to it. And I assume a terminal multiple under normal cases of 15, an optimistic uh, terminal multiple of 20 and a bearish case of 12. As you can see here, based on that, the fair value per share for me is around $55 right now. Based on the 10% margin of safety, it would be around $49 right now. So, so based on this, you could make an investment case to buy Intel or tip your toes into Intel around the current price. But I want you to know what my assumptions are behind this discounted cash flow model. Because if you go to other YouTube channels like, um, for instance, Everything Money, you will see like fair values for around 70, 80, 90. There's a reason for this because th what they do is they take the current free cash flow, 15 billion, and extrapolate it into the future. But you know, the company has announced already that they will have limited free cash flow because they're not maybe talking in free cash flow, but they're talking about increased capex and this influencing free cash flow. So what I've done here in 2021, this year, I'm assuming a free cash flow of 6 billion. And we know, remember, the dividends are around 5.5 billion right now. Based on the capex next year, I think it's 4 billion. I'm also taking assumptions that in 2023 and 2024, they're still heavily investing in uh, capex because they are talking now about foundry business and such, but they really need to up their game in innovation because what they are talking about now is a foundry business. This is not going to give them the mojo that they had before and a full market share as they had before and gross margins at the, as they had before. So they, in my opinion, they need to continue investing over the years to come. Based on that, I think the fair value per share would be $49. But if you know they can stop investing after three, four years and get back to the current cash flows, yes, then we're talking about the fair value per share of around $105. But that's a big if, really a big if. I don't trust these numbers. They're fixing now uh, the investment needed for founding business, but not for getting the full innovation capability back. If they're not just not able to even do, do well in the foundry business, then we're really talking about a share price of $28. So what you can see here is that there are big differences between these valuations. And that's why you need to really understand what you're investing in and effectively which narrative you follow. This is my business case. I think they lost their innovation mojo. So in my opinion, they still have to really, really um, invest over the upcoming years, a lot of capex. You can disagree with me or agree with me, but then you see here the other options that I foresee here. Pick your choice, choose one of those and invest according, accordingly. For me, I find it around these prices a buy zone. So what have I done with this? I sold a put option with a strike price of $47.5 for January next year. And it gave me a premium of one euros, one dollar seventy. This is around three point five percent in yield, as you could say, uh, twelve percent annual annualized or something like that. So I'm willing to buy some shares around forty-seven and a half dollars to dip my toes into Intel. I prefer it, of course, lower. We'll see where it brings me to.
So this is what I'm doing to, to make a benefit of this trade. I don't need to buy shares now. I, I have patience. I can wait till January and collect the premiums along the way. And as some people requested, I will create a video about uh, how I trade and put options and how it gives me some additional income later on. Expect somewhere one in the next few weeks uh, around this. Having said that, and to sum it up, Cut the list and mode. I'm not too positive about it when I see all these risks. Earnings growth, meh, strong free cash flow gra uh, grow the same. Don't expect a lot of that in, 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 the, in the upcoming uh, years. Healthy balance sheet, definitely dividend is, in my opinion, safe. They can they can easily go into debt uh, to increase, to continue increasing the dividends. And the, and the company is also announcing this, that they continue to grow their dividend over the next few years. From a valuation point of view, I think it's fairly valued. Now, actually trading at a slight discount. So this is it from my point of view. If you like these kinds of videos, don't forget to subscribe and like uh, this video. It will help me. Leave a comment if you enjoyed it as well. I really appreciate your feedback. It just puts a smile on my face. Having said that, enjoy the weekend. See you around.